Okay, welcome everyone to the um, our RCIA class, October, what is it, 29th? A uh, few days before Halloween. Um, normally we talk about what Catholics believe about Halloween, but we need to get to our church tour tonight. So uh, if you have questions about that, you'll have to ask me separately or we'll catch it next week. Um, but, but Catholics do believe in ghosts. So that's your teaser. Uh, tonight, um, we have um, some virtual guest presenters uh, that will uh, present our virtual church tour uh, with the COVID and considerations for that. Um, we're unable to just take a big crowd through the church at this point, but um, they put together an excellent uh, slideshow that I think you'll really enjoy. So um, we'll have uh, Cherie Gravois and Lynn Buzzard uh, with us tonight to present, and I'll do a little more introduction for them uh, in a moment, but let's, um, let's have a word of uh, scripture and a few opening comments tonight, and then we'll let them get started. Uh, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Today's uh, scripture share is uh, Luke chapter 21, uh, verses 1 to 4. This is no usually known as the widow's mite. When he looked up, he saw, when he looked up, he saw some wealthy people putting their offerings into the treasury, and he noticed a poor widow putting in two small coins. He said, I tell you truly, this poor widow put in more than all the rest, for those others have made, have all made offerings from their surplus wealth, but she, from her poverty, has offered her whole livelihood. Good and gracious God, we thank you for gathering us tonight we thank you so much for sharing your spirit with us. Help us to understand how you lift up our spirit through art. Uh, Lord, we ask your protection and guidance and spirit of joyfulness and gratitude uh, for us and for our families. In your name we pray, amen. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, just a couple of quick words. Um, uh, thinking about this tour tonight, uh, you know, the question often comes up, um, why do we spend so much money to make these Catholic churches so ornate and so beautiful uh, when we should just give all that money to the poor. We had a church, why'd we have to spend seven or $8 million on a new church we, when all these poor uh, people are out there? Good question, I like the question. Um, but I think the answer is partly in this scripture. Um, you know, Jesus um, preached in the temple. He appreciated the temple. Um, he is goodness. And St. Uh, Thomas Aquinas talks about uh, what he called uh, transcendence. Now, you don't have to write that word down. It's not on the test. It's a big word to show, show you that I did my homework. But uh, he helped us understand that there are certain things in life that transcend this world to the next, from, from earth to heaven, our world to the next. Um, Three things he mentioned, he talked about, um, truth, goodness, and beauty. Truth, goodness, and beauty. And I think the widow saw all three in the person of Jesus. Uh, Jesus is the truth. He is the truth and the way and life. Um, he is goodness, and he uh, demanded goodness of us to take care of each other, uh, but also of beauty. Uh, the beauty of heaven, the beauty of God that we will be celebrating in eternity. Uh, I think that when the human being sees something beautiful, it lifts my spirit. It lifts our spirit. Uh, and so the, the beautiness of our, of our architecture and our art and church uh, can help us in our spiritual journey. These are sacramentals that help us uh, in our journey towards heaven. Uh, so I think it is right and just. I think if Jesus was here and he asked the question about how we're dealing with our money, I think he would simply ask, well, did you take care of the widows and the orphans and those in need and the travelers? And, and yes, you know, this parish does that. Uh, and then we turn to the, to the places of worship and the, the making things nice and sort of thing like that. Uh, but the reason we do it is to help us as par parishioners uh, in our spiritual journey. And I think you'll see that in uh, 
genuinely through, through the slides that uh, Lynn and Sheree are gonna offer you. So I'm just gonna say just two quick words about them. Awesome people, heavily involved in the parish for, for decades and certainly heavily involved in the formation of, of what we celebrate in our new church here. Personal friends and heroes of mine uh, have uplifted me throughout the years and generally appreciate the, uh, the spirit that they bring uh, to our parish. Um, so for that though, I will let um, uh, Cherie take, take, the, uh, take the slides. Good evening, Cherie and I are delighted to be able to visit with you this evening for a virtual tour of St. John the Baptist. Um, and we hope that you enjoy it. We hope that it will help you when you walk around church in real time and real life. So Cherie has graciously put together a slide deck that I think will hit the highlights of the church, but there are endless little nooks and crannies that harbor treasures that will help you on your spiritual journey. So we encourage you to take the time to spend some personal time in the church as well. We're also grateful to Father Bahi, who actually orchestrated the building of the church and helped acquire many of the antiquities that help us in our prayerful journey. Father Bahi was adamant about having this church to the glory of God. And as uh, your faithful leader just alluded to, the widow's might means a lot when it's given from the heart. And a lot of people gave of their time and talent and treasures to give us the building that we now have to worship in. We have this church through the gracious generosity of Holy Trinity Church, which was a church that was founded in the late 1800s by a group of German Catholic immigrants. It said mass for over a decade with the last mass being said in 2010. From that point on, the church was shuttered. shuttered. A couple of years later, a coalition of St. John the Baptist parishioners visited Syracuse to assess and evaluate the contents of Holy Trinity Church and to ascertain whether or not these contents would fit into the church that we were planning at that time. These are original pictures that Cherie has gathered of Holy Trinity Church so it'll give you a, a sense of the style that the people had at that particular time. When the emissaries from Zachary went to Syracuse, they were impressed by the number of churches in this community. In the immigration days, every ethnic group had a church of their own. There was a German church like Holy Trinity. On another street corner, there may, there may have been an Italian Catholic church, an Irish Catholic church, a Polish Catholic church, church. In fact, when Scott visited, he said you could stand on one street corner and turn and see half a dozen Catholic churches in your visual range. Immigrants like to worship together, and I think that it brings a community together, no matter what the ethnicity, to worship in a beautiful surroundings. The groundbreaking for our church was in September of 2015, and the church was dedicated about a year and a half later by Bishop Munch. The church was designed by two Catholic high school of Baton Rouge graduates. They have an architectural firm called Ritter Mayer and the builders were Falk and Meek. Now, Steve Mayer and Scott Ritter took their Catholic roots and put what they learned and what they valued into the very foundation of our church. And you'll find these little things mean a lot. For example, when you look at the overall view of the facade of the church, you'll notice three main arches leading into the, to the foyer of the church. These are repeated as you enter into the vestibule, and then there are another set of three doors as you go from the vestibule to the sanctuary. This trio, of course, represents the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Catholics in, in Zachary have been around for an extremely long time. In the late 1800s, our ancestors migrated to Louisiana from Nova Scotia, and they worshiped in this area in a little log cabin church. Our church is currently the fifth site for St. John the Baptist Catholic Church, and by far is the largest we've ever had in the community. 
The church is about 18,000 square feet and it actually seats over 800 people. In the front of the church, very fittingly, you'll see our patron saint, St. John the Baptist. This statue was in front of our previous Catholic church, but when it was moved here, he was stood in a body of water to fittingly represent his baptismal experiences. The best view of our church is actually seen from the choir loft. If you have an opportunity, please scoot up those steps and enjoy this panoramic view. From here, you can see the neo-Gothic design of the church. It symbolizes a cross. There's a main central aisle that represents the vertical beam of the cross upon which our, our savior hung. Then there are, there are two side aisles in the transept that represent the horizontal beam of the cross. The chandeliers that hang in the church are not brass, they're actually painted gold, but they are aligned to light the way to the central focus of every church, which is of, co of course the altar and the tabernacle that it houses. These chandeliers were originally candle lit at Holy Trinity in Syracuse and were electrified later on. The pews in our church were actually acquired from two different churches in Pennsylvania. These didn't come from Holy Trinity, but they instead arose from the Allentown Diocese. The pews in the main portion of the nave are adorned with a neo-Gothic arch. These are the arches with the point at the top that you see this repeated throughout the church. The pews in the transepts instead are designed with a wooden cross on the sides. They were all refurbished painstakingly before they were placed in our church. Holy water fonts are placed at every entrance door to the church. When Catholics enter the church, we like to bless ourselves with the sign of the cross. It reminds us of our baptism and is a gesture of purification before we enter the presence of the Lord. These fonts were also obtained from the Allentown Diocese from a Slovenian church. Right now they're out of commission, but when COVID decides to leave, we hope to have them back at work. Now, our Catholic architects remind us that Jesus is the very foundation of our church spiritually, and in this case, physically as well. You'll notice as you enter the main nave, there are two stones that have diamond shaped etchings in them. These represent the feet of Christ as he hung on the cross. Remember the design of the church is a crucifix. So sure. these are his feet. The hands of Jesus are represented by singular diamond etchings at the east and west transept entrances. These are readily visible, but I'll ask you to call your attention when the church is empty to the interior of the seventh pew on the left, which is the seventh pew from the front. There is a darkened tile with another etched diamond that represents the pierced side of the Lord as he hung on the cross. So you can see that the architects went to great lengths to include our spirituality in the basic design of our church. Now the crucifix, the central focus as you enter the nave. It dangles or is suspended almost in unbelievably so from the ceiling of the church. This crucifix, to give you an idea of, of size, is I about 18 feet tall. And it's about 150 years old. As on many Catholic crucifixes, you'll see the letters I-N-R-I -I at the top of the crucifix. This is short for a Latin phrase. It translates Jesus of Nazareth king of the Jews. Now this crucifix didn't look this good when we got it here from Syracuse. Keith Morris actually restored this crucifix for, for us. Now Keith is a name that you might recognize. Keith was a Zachary native, grew up here, went to school here, then he became a missionary and traveled throughout the world and resides in Baton Rouge currently. And he's a fairly renowned artist. His brothers still live in Zachary. One brother is Dr. Mark Morris, the dentist, 
And the other brother is Harry Morris, who's a retired president of the Bank of Zachary. So we were happy to have a local gentleman add to the beauty of our church. Now we're going to see a large view of the high altar. Again, our architects with a scriptural reference created four steps to ascend to the altar. And these four steps represent the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When we approach the altar, we want to reverence the presence of the Eucharist in the tabernacle by genuflecting or bowing, making the sign of the cross. Taking the glory of this altar in its entirety, and it is attributed to the talent of a very, very uh, auspicious artist by the name of Egid Hackner. Before we go into detail on the high altar, I want to remind you that we're going to be very informal tonight. So if you have any questions at all, please interrupt. We'll be happy to try to answer them. And Cherie is right here and she'll be happy to add in. One aside I want to show you before we approach the altar is that as, a, as the crucifix is suspended, you'll notice two shadows of the crucifix. The lighting was, was done on purpose to create these shadows. During one of our tours of the church, a young girl, actually the granddaughter of one of our friends, was very astute and noticed these two crucifixes, raised her hand and asked if they could represent the two men who were crucified with Christ. Pretty deep thinking for a youngster. Then she added that one of the crucifixes, the one on the left, that shadow was a little more prominent than the one on the right. So she ascertained that this must represent the villain who hung with Christ and was saved by expressing his belief in our savior before his death. A little bit about Egan Hackman. This Bavarian immigrant was born to a poor Catholic family of 15 children. They were farm dwellers and as very likely in that day and six of the children survived to adulthood. Now, Egid became interested in churches at a young age as he witnessed the renovation of his local church. He was very enamored by the wood craftsmanship that went on. He served as an apprentice to a wood craftsman, and he became very adept at the trade. From there, he went through Germany, traveled, worked, and eventually enrolled in the School of Art in Munich. He added stone masonry to his resume at that point. Now, Egid had one of his six surviving siblings become a priest, and Father Willibald was already in the United States. Willibald liked it in the United States and urged his brother to come with him. So Egid crossed the big pond and joined his brother in the U.S. There he married, started raising a family, and as his family enlarged, he built a business that enlarged at a steady pace as well. He founded the E. Hatner Company that specialized in hand-carved church altars, pulpits, pews, etc. Six of Egan's children, he had eight, and six of them joined him in the business. This business survived through the Industrial Revolution well into the 1970s. Two of Egan's children actually entered religious life. One of them, named after Willibald, actually became a priest like his namesake. A daughter, Marietta, became a Franciscan nun. One of the first things Ega did when he came to America was build an altar for his brother Willibald, and from there his notoriety spread far and wide. Now this altar, the altar of sacrifice, was not original to Holy Trinity Church. Before Vatican II, priests said mass with their backs to the congregation as they faced the high altar. In an attempt to bring the mass to a more relatable state to the parishioners, priests then began to pray facing the congregation, speaking in the dialect and language of the locale. So after Vatican II, churches built altars of sacrifice. Our altar of sacrifice mingles the new and the old. Actually, my husband Scott designed and built this altar using some of the 
pedestals that Egid Hackner carved and then adding newer elements, duplicating the antique look that was, that was present in the original. I have to give credit to Cherie for the central part of the altar. Scott was trying to decide what he should put in the middle of the altar and he had a couple of ideas. If you remember back in the original, the older Catholic church where we came to, from previously, there was a white altar, a wooden altar in the back of church. This altar had been in the previous, previous Catholic church, which is now the red brick building of the Episcopal church in Zachary. This casting, plaster casting, was in deplorable condition, but Cherie could envision its restoration and Scott was convinced to incorporate it in the altar and we're so happy that he did. The quartz top of the altar is about four inches thick and at the, the dedication of the church, Bishop, Bishop Munch actually consecrated every square inch of that altar. Here's a close up view of the casting of the Last Supper. And you can see that Keith did an extremely good job of its restoration. I'll urge you to climb up those four steps, view this in, in very, very close detail because you can see every fold in the garments of the disciples, every expression on their faces, every crease in the table covering, every thread woven into the table covering. Now, it didn't always look like this. This particular plaster casting actually resided in uh, our house for a long time, in our guest room and then in Scott's shop. And that was chipped and marred and faded. In fact, the chalice that sits in front of Jesus was actually hanging on literally by a little metal thread. One day, Scott was working in his shop and our grandson who follows in his footsteps was with his papa. And when I walked in, Scott didn't notice that Luke was actually dangling the chalice. So he was able to stop before it became a separate fixture and Keith was able to restore it to its original beauty. One thing I wanna mention before we go much further is that Cherie has included lots of scripture verses on the bottoms of the slides. And this reminds me to tell you that we do have a guide booklet if you wanna do a self-guided tour through the church and it has scriptural references as well, which will kind of enhance your experience as you go through and notice all the details in the church. Now, every Catholic altar and every Catholic church houses a relic. A relic is a part of a saint's physical remains or part of their personal effects that has been officially recognized by the Catholic church. Now the relic in our altar is actually the relic that was in Holy Trinity Church. It's a relic of Sister Marianne Cope, who was from Syracuse. Now, Sister Mary Ann was a devoted Franciscan nun who worked for years along with a priest called Father Damien Buster. They worked on the island of Molokai in Hawaii, caring for victims of leprosy. We think it's, it is extremely fitting that she now is housed in the only other state in the union that took care of leprosy patients. Her remains, or not her remains, her, part of her coffin, a little piece of wood, is housed in a drawer that Scott tucked away underneath the altar. We don't take it out very often because it's really fragile. The high altar. What a fantastic centerpiece for our church. To give you a perception of size, this altar is 27 feet tall. The painting of the Holy Trinity you see in the center is seven feet tall. And it is the Holy Trinity because it was designed originally by an artist called Oswald Vogel for Holy Trinity Church in Syracuse. Above the painting of the Trinity, you'll notice a P crossed with an X. These are actually the Greek letters, Chi, which is the X, Rho, which is the P. And these are the first two letters in the word Christ in the Greek language, Christos. There are many other beautiful statues on this cross that were, that were um, 
carved out of single pieces of wood and they stand about five feet tall. St. Athanasius on the left, St. Augustine on the right, and then the two smaller statues at the bottom are St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Julian Amard. The two bigger statues are men who were doctors of the church that wrote profound pieces on the Holy Trinity. The two smaller statues are more near the tabernacle because these two men wrote more about the Eucharist. In addition to the, the picture of the Holy Trinity are two other oil paintings by Mr. Vogel. On the left, you'll see the sacrifice of Abraham. This is from the Old Testament and he's joined by another Old Testament representation of the sacrifice of Mal Malchizedek to one of the high priests who is really the first in the Bible to mention sacrificing bread and wine as we do in every consecration at mass. One of my favorite wood carvings is actually tucked away behind the altar of sacrifice. So, so you'll have to circumnavigate a little bit to see this one, but it's worth the trip. This is a wood carving at the base of the high altar that depicts two deer drinking from a fountain of water or a stream. This is in reference to Psalm 42. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. This is a beautiful wood carving. So please take time to view it in person. You'll also notice that the Lamb of God sits atop this altar. The tabernacle, the focal point of every church, houses the Eucharist, such an, an important part of every altar. The tabernacle is reminiscent of the Israelites' Ark of the Covenant that went with them as they spent years and years in the wilderness. Remember that God fed the Israelites manna, and sometimes it's referred to in the Old Testament as the bread of angels. So around the tabernacle, you'll notice two small statues of angels, as well as six carved circular cherubs right above the tabernacle. The sanctuary light, it references the tabernacle as well. On the right side of the altar, this is a rather unassuming fixture. It's a brass lantern with a red um, glass globe. It burns continuously as long as there is Eucharist housed in the tabernacle. So if that candle is burning, you are truly in the presence of our Lord. This particular sanctuary light was donated by one of our parishioners. She acquired it from her sister, Mary Cecilia, who was a, a nun at a Dominican monastery. So she was a cloistered nun in Newark, New Jersey and managed to acquire this for us. The pulpit is another prominent fixture on the altar, maybe not as prominent as of its previous home, the pulpit is elevated to represent the elevated stature of the scriptures. In some churches, the pulpit is so high that the priest has to climb several steps. The priest or deacon usually read the gospel, but the other two readings, the one from the Old Testament and the New Testament at mass are usually read by laity. The sermon is also presented from the pulpit. This again, you can see the, the repeated effects of the neo-Gothic design that Egan Hackner used in his carvings. I also wanna to call to your attention that we do have a communion rail in front of the altar and in every arch of that communion rail is a unique identifiable carving. So take some time to look at that as well. These also bear the colors of red, green and gold, which are the colors of the Holy Trinity. The baptismal font stands at the front of church. Now this is an outstanding work of art that is carved from a singular piece of Italian Carrera marble. Equally significant is the seven-sided wood top that pivots on a single hinge. So when it is rotated, it, 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 it shows you the basin of the baptismal font for the sacraments to be given. 
The seven sacraments are represented by the seven sides of this baptismal font. Behind the altar is the sacristy. The sacristy is where we prepare for mass. This carved cabinet that you see was from Holy Trinity in Syracuse. And it is actually the only piece of Egid Hackner's furniture that we received that actually bears his name. This sacrament cabinet does for us what it did over a hundred years ago in Holy Trinity. It houses things that we need to administer the sacraments. There's also a vesting room in next to the sacristy. And this private room is where father goes to prepare for mass. He has time to pray here. There's another tabernacle here that can house the Eucharist with its own sanctuary lamp. And this is where, of course, he dresses for mass. There are many different vestments that, that are color-coded according to the scriptural calendar. There's so many that Scott actually built an additional vestment closet that uh, mimics the design of Egan Hackner, and it lies in the sacristy as well. There are many side altars in the church, and we'll go through those rather quickly. This is our Marian altar. Now the backdrop is a little different now because it's been painted, but it is there to signify how we adore Mary, the mother of God. Now this particular statue of Mary predated Holy Trinity Church. She was already a hundred years old when she, when she was moved to Holy Trinity. Add another hundred years to that, and you'll understand that this this statue is actually over 200 years old. Interestingly enough, her facial features and the facial features of the infant Jesus are made of egg whites and sawdust. What artistic license they took at that time. St. Joseph's altar is on the opposite side of the, ch of the church's main altar. This is Mary's husband and the father of Jesus. He is a central figure in the Holy Family and serves as the patron saint of woodworkers and fathers as well. And this statue also adorned Holy Trinity. Now we have some newer statues at our side altars. Mother Teresa is a statue that was acquired in Rome in 2016. Father Bahi has a special dedication to Mother Teresa because he spent lots of time with her. He worked with her serving the poorest of the poor in care for seven different summers. On one of his visits, as her health was phasing, fading, rather, he was honored to perform the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. He had the discretion to retain the oil, the holy oils and the cotton that he used to perform the sacrament and on his trip to Rome to discuss with the Pope and report on Mother Teresa's health, he brought the relics, turned them over to a sacristan at the Vatican who then made relics from them. So we are very fortunate to have a relic of Mother Teresa in this tomb or duplication of her tomb. So if you have a chance, you can visit this side altar. And if you'll notice the blue and white background of her statue, that is uh, reminiscent of the habits worn by the Sisters of Charity. Pope St. John Paul statue is also a new statue that was acquired at the same time as that of Mother Teresa. Now beneath his statue is also a replica of his tomb. We are also fortunate enough to have a relic of Pope St. John Paul. This Polish Pope was so beloved that many, many people wanted to visit his grave after his death in 2005. His original grave was housed in the catacombs underneath St. Peter's Basilica. And if you've ever visited there, you know that you have to descend some fairly treacherous, steep, kind of craggly stone steps and it's a little bit of a hike. So many people were making that hike to, to venerate Pope St. John Paul that the Vatican decided to move his remains and house them on the upper main floor at St. Peter's. When they did that, they found that the Pope's blood was still fluid after five years of interment. 
this blood was this was then made into relics and we are fortunate again to have one of the relics here so we have three important relics in our church sister marianne pope mother teresa and pope saint john paul pope saint john paul statue is actually housed by um the very rightfully so as he was pope by the confessionals and we'll visit those in just a minute another couple of altars we have this one is devoted to the sacred heart of jesus the flaming heart is usually encircled by a crown of thorns to remind us of the suffering and love that christ endured for all of us then there's St. John the Baptist on the other side. These two statues are in the back of church. And we'll find that St. John the Baptist is holding the Lamb of God. And he was actually the first human to recognize Jesus as Jesus leapt in his mother's womb. When Saint, actually St. John the Baptist leapt in his mother's room as Jesus, is, Jesus approached him in Mary's room. Now, this is the end of the side altars. If there are any questions, we'll be happy to take them now. First, let me just tell you a little bit about votive candles. Near all of these altars, all six side altars, you'll notice candles that are lit as a reminder of our desire to bring Christ, the light of the world, into our prayer lives. We light these candles and pray in front of these statues, not because we're praying to these saints, we're actually praying more through these saints. So help, help yourself maybe by visualizing these saints as prayer chains to heaven. So we ask for their intercession, but we are in direct line praying to God. Any questions? Okay, well, we'll continue. The perimeter of the church has a lot to be seen. So let's get started with the stained glass windows. The stained glass windows we have are not from Holy Trinity. They're actually from a church in the Allentown Diocese of Pennsylvania. There's a particular organization called the Sacred Window Rescue Project led by a gentleman called Joseph Beyer. He finds and then catalogs and houses these, these windows taken from decommissioned and destroyed churches and he holds on to them and tries to relocate them into new churches or churches undergoing renovations. We were fortunate to find these statues, these windows that are in the Munich style as they were made by the Franz Meyer studio. So they are very much in line with the work that we have in the wooden antiquities from Holy Trinity. These windows date back to the 1800s and they were in a church in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Now they weren't in this condition when our emissaries purchased them. Scott Brennan, who actually is a third generation stained glass artist from Syracuse, painstakingly restored these windows and then brought them to Zachary and installed them. Notice that these are Munich style windows, meaning that they are painted glass. They are not mosaics made of bits and pieces of glass. You'll see duplicates of some of the windows in our church. Like we have two depictions of the Garden of Gethsemane, two depictions of the Nativity. That's because we acquired four windows from the very generous Olin family. We don't know where these Munich style windows originated, but they're happily invested in our church. Bubba Olin, as in Olin's Furniture, acquired these windows many, many years ago. His sister, Pat, was actually my piano teacher as a child, and she remembers these windows being housed in hay in a, in a barn in Poincapie Parish for many years. She said her brother bought them because he thought they were pretty. Dr. Hecolin, upon the death of his brother, paid to have the windows restored by Baton Rouge artist Steve Wilson. Steve Wilson's art also adorns one of the Presbyterian churches in Zachary. At any rate, we're very, very happy to have the Olin windows and they fit very nicely in with the windows we have from Pennsylvania. One important stained glass window lies near the confessionals and next to the statue of Pope St. John Paul. 
This window is a depiction of Jesus handing the keys to the kingdom to St. Peter, who is our first Pope. Remember what Jesus said. These are the keys to the kingdom. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. As descendants of the first Pope, this is the mission of the priest who sits in that confessional as he listens to our confidences. Now, the keys to the kingdom are represented above each confessional. They are etched there. And we think one simplistic but emphatic way to view these keys is this. What's said inside that confessional is locked away. It's between you, the priest, and God. On the top of the confessionals are two circular wood carvings. The confessional to the left of the exiting door of the east nave depicts the prodigal son. How fitting is that? That the father always guides us back when we go astray. These confessionals are duplicates. You face a screen and kneel, father sits behind the central door and one person at a time says their confession. The confessional on the other side of that door is different. You can either kneel and speak to Father anonymously, or you can walk around and talk to him seated in a chair face to face. The wooden carving on top of that confessional is Jesus as the Good Shepherd. Other beautiful artwork on the perimeter of the church include the 14 Stations of the Cross. These were done by the same German artist, Oswald Vogel, who did the Holy Trinity picture and the two Old Testament oil paintings on the high altar. Oswald Vogel was renowned in his time. He created only three sets though of the, of the Stations of the Cross and we are extremely blessed to have the only complete set left in the whole world. These are framed by intricately carved frames from the E. Hackner com Company. Now, as Catholics, you may be more familiar or will become familiar with the Stations of the Cross as we recite the litany during the Way of the Cross. We follow Christ's passion. You can also do this in the Holy Land if you want to walk in the footsteps of Christ, as this was common practice in the, in the Middle Ages. But as it became more difficult for people to travel, the Stations of the Cross and that tradition took firm root in the Catholic Church. Another thing we want to mention is that this artwork, the, the Stations of the Cross in oils, the glass stained glass windows, are depicting pictorially the life of Christ. Remember that people could not always read, and, but this is something they could understand and relate to in pictures. Remember, a picture's worth a thousand words. And on to other pictures. If you look up the central aisle in church and even on the transepts, you'll see these four foot in diameter depictions of the 12 apostles. Well, the 12 apostles minus Judas plus Matthias. These circular portraits are replicas of work done by the great master Peter Paul Rubens. The originals hang in the Museo de Prade in Madrid. These are called gicles, as in the term coined by Jacques Dugan, a Frenchman who developed the inkjet technology that result in these very, very fine looking, but affordable master's paintings. Now, that is a depiction of our virtual tour of the church. There's so many more things for you to appreciate and enjoy. We hope you'll take the time and maybe sometime in the future, Cherie and I can join you for a personal guided tour of the church. And we're here, both of us, to answer any questions you might have. We hope you enjoyed it. And we hope that this church, as, as Joey said in the beginning, will help you in a prayerful visitation with the Lord. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Nice. Virtual clapping. Virtual clapping going on. <laughs>
questions uh, either in the chat room or if you're virtual, unmute yourself uh, and say it out loud or any questions from the group that's here. Anybody? Comments, questions? It was great. What's that? Why did the, the question was, why was the church in Syracuse closed? Well, as often happens in inner cities, people begin to move to the suburbs. As they move to the suburbs, the congregation could no longer financially sustain Holy Trinity Church. And in many inner city churches, it was shuttered. We were just happy to be able to give a home to all of these antiquities. In fact, a couple years ago, when LSU played Syracuse, we had visitors from Syracuse that came to our church to view the things that we acquired from them. And it meant a lot to them because the people that built these churches weren't wealthy. They really sacrificed a lot. And, and they were proud to see that what their fathers and grandfathers did found a new home that appreciated all of that effort and time. Yeah, I, I uh, was born, uh, we moved when I was young, but uh, born in a little town not far from Syracuse. And the uh, way uh, Lynn described the, you know, the atmosphere there is, is, uh, is very true. It's different from, you know, in the South, you know, in the suburbs, it, you know, we don't generally walk to church, but in my little town there, not far from Syracuse, you know, you just walked to church and, and just like your mom did and, and your grandma did and, and her parents before them, of course, my grandparents were immigrants, but, uh, and families came, you know, together and you would walk to church and, um, and they were so beautiful. And, you know, you'd look forward to your, you know, if you were a young person getting married in your church and, and, and when you raise children, you know, they were married in the church and, and, and now we have, you know, a beautiful place for our children to receive the sacraments and, um, you know, but those towns in the Northeast uh, were such a community in a personal way. Uh, you know, say you walk into church with your friends and, and neighbors, uh, um, you know, it just had that, had that aspect of, of togetherness, of neighborhood, community, um, you know, and everybody taking care of each other. But the focal, focal was the church. You know, if you needed to know something, you went to the church. If there was an emergency, you went to the church. You know, if it was a big ball game, you went to church to pray. You know, big boxing match, you went to church to pray. Um, you know, the church was and should be the focal point of the community. Questions, questions, questions. Anybody else? Comments? That was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, Thank that you was good. Here. Very we good. Good. Uh, I'm going to... I'm going to end the uh, recording, but leave our session still on. So um, anybody sharing this by recording, thank you for attending. Thanks, Joe. Uh, thank you, ladies. Really enjoyed it. We were.